Ratchet Clark lived with her mother, Henriette, in a small, gloomy, sub-basement apartment in Pensacola, Florida. They had no windows, but if they had, she imagined they would be able to see worms, grubs, and strange, scary insects. There would be larvae eating the corpses that people had snuck into the apartment yard to bury under cover of night. Only her and her mother's thin bedroom walls separated them from this place of nightmares. Ratchet never slept well, but Henriette did. She snored loudly as soon as she hit the pillow. Ratchet worried about her, worn out as she always was from waiting tables at the hunt club and cleaning other people's apartments. She sometimes dreamt of these creatures making their way through the wall in the middle of the night, worms drilling small holes, slipping through, getting into her mother's skull via her ears. She woke often, listening for the sound of small industrious insects. Sometimes these dreams were so real that she'd awake the next morning and stare worriedly at Henriette's ears, looking for evidence, searching for tiny holes. Once, when Henriette caught her at this, she said, don't stare at me that way. How can I take you to the Pensacola Hunt Club? They'll think you're a half-wit. The Pensacola Hunt Club, with its horses, tennis, swimming, and sumptuous clubhouse, had been Henriette's beacon of light for the last 13 years. She coveted a membership. She didn't own a horse and didn't ride, but she would bring home riding pants, crops, and helmets, the things that made her appear as if she did. The Pensacola Hunt Club, she'd say, striding around the house with her riding crop tucked underneath her arm. She wore big black riding boots that reached almost to her knees. Her skin bulged over the top like knee socks turned over. It wasn't very elegant, but fortunately she didn't look down very often. She thought she looked simply topping. How do I look today, Ratchet? she would ask. And if Ratchet didn't say, simply topping, an icy silence would prevail. That night, as the gloom of night descended, which it did even earlier in their sub-basement than in the rest of Florida, they sat about the kitchen table having their Ovaltine and Cheerios. It was silent in the apartment. Henriette had no friends and was hardly ever home, and Ratchet was not allowed to make friends. Don't hold your spoon like that, Ratchet. The hunt club, the hunt club, said Henriette suddenly. Then Henriette repeated what she always did. Thank God for the hunt club. Yes, the hunt club. Ratchet agreed as usual. Thank God for that. Yes. Where would we be without it? Nowhere, that's where. Well, thank God for it. Yep, that's for sure, Ratchet said hopefully. And then Henriette's eyes went stony again and the house returned to silence. Ratchet found the whole idea of the hunt club comforting, its lushness having been described to her since she was a baby. She wanted to go there with Henriette, but Henriette said that it wasn't a good idea because of that thing on Ratchet's shoulder blade and how it would reflect on her, Henriette. And I wish I'd given you a different name. Oh, she said, sighing. That was your father's fault. Did he choose my name? asked Ratchet. Henriette shrugged and looked impatient. I was young. It was just one of those things you do when you're young. Ratchet had never seen her father. He'd taken a powder after her birth. I'd just given birth, which is a frightful experience. Nothing prepares you for it. They won't even let you eat until it's all over, no matter how hungry you get. They won't let you do anything but breathe. I didn't want to breathe. I wanted a hamburger. And then when it's all over and they finally do bring you something to eat, it's really yucky. What did they bring you? I don't remember Ratchet. Ugh. Chicken and cream sauce, probably. That's the only thing they ever serve for dinner in the hospital. They may call it by another name. They may say, for instance, it's ham bake or Salisbury steak, but it's really always chicken and cream sauce. Ratchet salivated. They hadn't had anything like chicken and cream sauce in a long time. Ham bacon Salisbury steak sounded pretty good, too. They'd been living on Cheerios since Henriette bought her new riding habit. Okay, so then after I say, take that baby away and bring me some chicken and cream sauce, they wheel me into this room with seven other new mothers. Naturally, I make a fuss. I mean, if I wanted to hang out with a bunch of other women, I would have lived in a commune, right? would have had my labor in some touchy-feely ashram, so I kept pressing my call button over and over until they got me out of there. The nurses think I'm a little wacko, and believe me, at that point, after a whole day in the hospital with all those crummy smells, I practically am, and they move me into the only private room left, which happens to be empty because the pipes are being fixed in there. The workmen continue on the pipes because they say they have a work order, and while the nurse goes out to get someone bigger and stronger, I get rid of them by throwing bits of placenta about. Bits of what? Ratchet asked. Of course, it was really cherry jello for my second dinner tray, but they didn't know that. 
They left in a hurry. Can you imagine putting workmen in a new mother's room? Whoop. Anyhow, I'm about to heave a sigh of relief when I see one of them has left a tool on the windowsill. Well, that's the last straw because it means somebody is going to come clomping in in the middle of the night to retrieve it. I didn't notice it at first because your father and I were deep in a fight over what to name you. It's very tense having a baby, you know, ratchet. No one tells you what you're supposed to do with it once it's out of your stomach. It's just there. That's why new mothers are always forgetting and leaving their babies in the washrooms of public places. Because who can keep track all the time? Naming you should have been the easy part of the whole deal. But of course, nothing was ever easy with your father. I like the name Eugenie. And your father kept saying, Stinko, let's name her Stinko, just to be funny. Can you imagine annoying me after the kind of day I'd had? Then he says, or how about fart? Fart Clark. <laughs> I'd say Yvonne. He'd say Belch. She just wasn't listening. He was too busy being hilarious. That's when I saw the tool on the windowsill. Who left that ratchet on the windowsill, I asked. But of course, he can't just answer the question. He has to argue. No, it's not a ratchet. It's a lug wrench. Well, I knew a ratchet when I saw one. So we're arguing away, and he starts shouting. Oh, he could be so moody, Ratchet. He just never knew when he was going to erupt. It was quite frightening, really. And he, he threatens to wheel my bed to the window, crank it up, and tip me out if I don't admit it's a lug wrench. So I just pick up a magazine and pretend to read an article about polo ponies and ignore him. I always found it was better to ignore him when he had moods. Ratchet. I say airily as he cranks up the top part of the bed so that I begin to slip gently down those slippery hospital sheets toward the open window. And that's another thing. Hospital sheets are made out of some kind of synthetic fiber between polyester and nylon so the patients are constantly slipping off their beds. Thud, thud, thud. You hear all night long in hospitals. Nine out of ten hospital patients break a bone while rolling over for a glass of water in the middle of the night. The other 10% die of heartbreak when they find out they don't have any water and what the chances are of getting some. Anyhow, lug wrench, says your father. Ratchet, I say. Lug wrench, he says. Just as my legs slide out the open fifth floor window, my nightgown all bunched up and my bare thighs dangling in the breeze, a nurse comes racing in, squealing. Oh, oh Miss, Mr. Clark, Mrs. Clark, if it's fresh air you want, you need only ask for a wheelchair. Then she hauls me in and slams the window shut in case we forget and make that mistake again. Anyhow, I keep pretending to read, which drives your father crazy, and he's about to go on another rampage when he hears someone in the hall exclaim that Havana cigars are being passed out in the waiting room and dashes off. While he's gone, a woman comes in for the birth certificate information, and I grab the form and fill out Ratchet Ratchet in the space for the first and middle names. And that's how you became Ratchet Ratchet Clark. Oh, and by the way, you're going to Maine tonight. I'm going where? Ratchet gasped. Maine. Maine? Why am I going there? You're spending the summer with great second cousins, Tilly and Pen Pen Minuto. You can just call them aunts. I call them Aunt Tilly and Aunt Pen Pen, and they always referred to me as their niece. You can be a niece too. Who says great second cousin once removed Tilly, or whatever it would be? It's too much of a mouthful. They're some distant relatives or other. I'd almost forgotten about them. I used to spend summers with them. You're old enough now to get some away from home experience, and that's the only free place I could think of. I'm going tonight? Why didn't you tell me before? I thought it would make a nice surprise. Come on, hurry up. It's going to take two days to get there. I've got train and bus tickets for you. You like sleeping on the train, the clickety-clack and all that. Here's your itinerary. Hurry up, Ratchet. Get your coat. But, but it's hot out, Ratchet said. Not in Maine. Don't they teach you anything at school? Henriette was walking swiftly up the basement stairs to the parking lot. She drove purposefully, with no idea where she was going. She had never been to the train station, but she figured, what the heck, she had a map. Henriette took the same routes through Pensacola and never deviated from her habitual courses. Within minutes, they were lost. Ratchet clutched her seat nervously as Henriette flustered that the streets weren't where she figured they should be, almost hit a pedestrian, and ran a stop sign. It was at this point that Henriette remembered Ratchet's suitcase sitting at home. Too late, she said. Too late, damn it. Well, I'll try to remember to send you a few things. She swung into a convenience store to find someone who could tell them how to get to the train station, and they got there just minutes before the train pulled out. I didn't even know I had any relatives, Ratchet said as they hurried across the platform. They were already old when I spent summers with them. They must be casket ready by now. 
Pen Pen was kind of fat and happy happy all the time, and Tilly looked like a sphincter. Like a what? Ratchet asked, but the conductor was hurrying her up the steps to the train. She and her mother didn't say goodbye. Her mother had long ago told her that in their family there were no good at hellos, no good at goodbyes, and not much good with the stuff in between. As Ratchet turned, she could hear her mother trying to shout something to her over the roar of the train starting up. What? Ratchet called through the open train door. Keep that thing covered! Henriette cried and headed back to the parking lot. Ratchet watched her mother's retreating form as long as she could, then went into the train car. People were already slumped and slumbering, their faces pressed against windows or their heads hanging heavy on their chests. There weren't any seats next to women available, so she sat next to a man who was sound asleep and drooling slightly on his lapel. She felt a terrible wrench at being pulled away from her mother, like a boot being pulled out of thick mud with a great sucking sound. But she knew her mother would despise such feelings. They were fussy. She put her feet and knees together and her hands in her lap and kept this position pretty much all the way to Maine. Tilly was tiny and very, very thin. Pen Pen was round and jolly, just as Henriette had said, and even though she had short white hair, she didn't look all that old, not nearly as old as Tilly. But Ratchet knew that she must be because the first thing that Tilly said to her when she got in their waiting car was, We are twins. We were born together, we grew up together, we have lived our whole lives together, and we have plans to die together. The thing is, as I tried to explain to your mother, who, by the way, <laughs> We are living somewhere very remote, <laughs> interrupted Pen Pen, flashing Ratchet a smile from the front seat. So if we die, you will be stuck. That's all I was trying to tell Henriette. But as usual, she wasn't listening. Stuck, said Tilly glumly, putting on her driving gloves. Tilly sat on two phone books and a cushion, and yet she could barely see over the wheel. Ratchet sat in the back seat. It was blackout. In fact, the night sky, the whole night air of the Maine woods, had an oily quality, a dark so deep you could almost see rainbows in it. Ratchet had no idea where she was. Her ticket said dairy, but Henriette had told her that her great aunts had a house past Dink. All these D names blurred in her mind as they drove through tiny lit streets. Finally, even the few lights of town were gone, and she was too tired to track their journey further too tired to do anything but try to remain upright in the back seat and be polite. If something were to happen to one of us, as I tried to explain to your mother on the phone, you'd be sunk, Tilly went on. Unless you learn to drive the Daimler, of course. <laughs> your mother, oh look, a bear, said Pen Pen. Ratchet pressed her face to the window to see the bear, but saw nothing except more darkness, so she leaned back, the roads became narrower. Pen Pen asked if anyone wanted a brown bag, of which they kept a healthy supply up front. Oh, just in case. Ratchet reached a hand forward for one, but although Tilly's driving made her queasy, she never needed to use it. Instead, she fidgeted, twisting and untwisting it. Tilly drove 20 miles an hour and made many sudden jerky stops because she kept thinking she saw things in the dark. Pen Pen would crane her neck around, checking the car on all sides before saying, oh, Drive on, Tilly. And Tilly would drive on until she saw the next mirage and jerk to another stop and another until they finally stopped for good beyond a gate with a sign reading, Glen Rosa. The Minuto house was enormous, made from old brick and spouting a profusion of towers and turrets that reached up in line with the tops of the pines that encircled it to prick the vast starry sky. From the front yard, where Tilly stopped the car, Ratchet could hear the sound of the sea crashing on rocks somewhere below. She tripped sleepily toward the house. She had spent 48 hours traveling, most of them sleepless, and could barely keep track of her feet. Don't fall down the cliff! said Pen Pen, grabbing Ratchet's shirt between her shoulder blades and yanking her back. Ratchet was so tired that the sudden sight of white foam spraying below and the realization that she had almost joined it with a splash didn't startle her. But Pen Pen's hand on her shirt did. She immediately and instinctively jerked away, wondering if Pen Pen had felt that thing through the thin fabric. But if she had, 
she registered nothing. Ratchet looked down after that and followed the white rock walkway up to the house. She was too tired to take any notice of her surroundings. All she could remember as she drifted off to sleep was climbing a large, winding staircase and being shown to a room from where she could hear the sound of the sea even louder, banging its way towards shore and back. Why does it keep doing that? she thought. Why can't it just shut up? And fell asleep in her underwear.